Hey everyone, welcome back to Reading with Raptors. We are starting off on a bit of an exciting note here. Uh, our, I was going to give this to you a little bit later, but we were getting a little bit restless. I think she could see it. Uh, this is Reading with Raptors here at the University of Minnesota Raptor Center. And I am, of course, with uh, one of our guests um, here is our resident female bald eagle, who we call Max. She's one of our raptor ambassadors um, here to teach people about bald eagles and their role in the environment. Right now, what she's doing um, is doing a great demonstration of the scavenging skills that bald eagles have to have out in the wild. Um, they, of course, are excellent hunters of fish, but they are also scavengers. So there's a little bit of problem solving that goes into that. Um, and so a little bit of what she's doing is figuring out how to get the little pieces of food out of them. Um, this is one of those kind of those cardboard containers that you can get if you get multiple drinks at a restaurant or a coffee shop or something. They give you that cardboard container that can hold four of them. Uh, these were two of those stacked together with some little pieces of rats in between. Um, so she's working on that right now. Maybe I might see if I can move. Give us a little bit better view of what she's doing. So she's going to be working on those as we get started here. Um, looks like she's already found all the little pieces. And one more. Uh, all the little pieces of rat that she's working on and is now going to shred the cardboard here. Uh, cardboard products, things like this, that recycled paper material actually make for really great enrichment toys. Um, since they are able to really easily shred them apart, they're easy to kind of clean up, they're non-toxic. Um, so even if she does accidentally eat a piece or two, no worries, it'll come out with her pellet, which will be all of the kind of fur that she's not able to digest of that rat. So make for some really good enrichment. So we see when we can re reuse and recycle cycle some of those supplies here at the Raptor Center. So that's what she's working on as we get started. I wanted to read with a bald eagle today for kind of a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, we are actually coming up uh, this weekend, actually, on the uh, United States Independence Day, 4th of July. Um, so a great fitting time to be talking about bald eagles. Um, it is also, I found a great book that is not actually about birds, but it's one I've been wanting to read for a while. I've been waiting for a good occasion. This one is called Hungry Coyote. Um, and so it's not about birds, but it is about another scavenger that a lot of us see even in urban environments. Um, and I thought a great word to talk about with that would be another very famous scavenger that we see a lot of, especially now in some urban environments. Here in the Twin Cities area, we actually have a lot of bald eagles nesting. I know I see a couple usually on my way, just a short drive into work every day in the northern suburbs. So uh, seeing a lot of them around, so hopefully people are seeing lots of them. And a lot of people also see a lot of coyotes living in kind of urban areas. So these are some uh, different scavengers that have actually done quite well living near people and kind of adapting to that. I'm moving so you can see her uh, wiping her beak off. So that beak wiping behavior, sorry for the shaky camera here for a minute. That beak wiping behavior is called feeking. So it's gonna kind of wipe their beaks off, keep their beaks nice and sharp, uh, being able to rub them on different surfaces. Their beaks are kind of like your fingernails. They're always growing in that same kind of hard but kind of potentially flaky material of that keratin. So wiping them off can kind of help sharpen them and keep them in shape. So she's gonna clean up her toes, clean up everything, make sure everything is squeaky clean. I'll move this back. So. I think she thought I was putting food on it. I'm sorry. That was not food. That was me just moving your mailbox. I'm so sorry. So I'll move that here in a uh, in a few minutes. We'll let her wander around. Right now she is just right awkwardly off camera. So I'll see if I can move this around. I don't want to have to move the camera around too terribly much as we go along because that gets pretty distracting. But we have just fully tipped our perch over. So while she's kind of finding a spot to get settled in, we'll kind of get started here with introducing, this is Hungry Coyote. Um, this is by Cheryl Blackford, illustrated by Lori Capel. And I also really love this because I, if I am not mistaken, this is the Twin Cities in the background. For anyone who is familiar with our beautiful skyline, we have the Fauché building there, uh, different towers. Some of you might recognize that beautiful. This is gonna sound kind of sappy coming from a, uh, environmental educator kind of background, but I always think that the Minneapolis skyline is really pretty. So I was very excited to see it on this book. So this is Hungry Coyote with our bald eagle. Might be, might be moving around a little bit. I'll show you this first kind of page just because the colors are gorgeous. This is another reason why I wanted to read this book is because it has a lot of wintry scenes in it. And right now, a very good portion of North America is under some absolutely unprecedented heat waves. 
Uh, Minnesota, we had our time a little bit earlier this summer and we're going to get hit with that heat again. So, um, so I thought it would be nice to kind of read up, maybe a slightly more wintry book to kind of uh, bring us back to a little bit cooler times. Um, this book, I'll show you that I'm covering up the, I, I borrowed this book from a volunteer, so I'll cover up that, but it was actually signed by the author and kind of a local author, if I'm not mistaken. So this is the front cover of Hungry Coyote. And here's another one. Ah, yes, this is. This is the Minnesota Historical Society Press. So for any of you here in Minnesota, this is a local author and local publisher, which I thought was really exciting. Here's a nice, beautiful kind of nighttime scene with a coyote skulking around underneath this street light. Looks like a couple of leaves blowing around in the fall. Let's see if I can angle this down here so you can keep an eye on what she's doing. Down at the lake, the ice groans and thumps. Sloppy snowflakes tumble and twirl, clumping on hats, mittens, and eyelashes. Children slip, slide, and glide. Coyote slinks toward slick ice. Wary and watchful, he sneaks past the crowd. I'll see if I can angle this just a wee bit more. So we could try to see her and the book. There we go. At the shore, voles scurry through secret tunnels. Coyote creeps between snow-frosted trees. He listens, sniffs, and leaps. Flump! No vole for Coyote today. So here's our Coyote rearing up on those hind legs and trying to pounce down into the snow. And there's a the little vole hiding underneath that snow down by these little cattails on the pond. No such luck for our Coyote today. No rabbits, mice, or squirrels either. A bitter wind scours the lake. Hungry coyote howls for the spring. This beautiful winter landscape. Those of us in places with winter probably recognize a lot of these colors of that kind of sunrise or sunset in the winter. Ugh, very cold, very chilly. Down at the lake, wind whips waves into frothy peaks. Pale rays of sun warm the water. In the marsh, the frog orchestra tunes up. Children poke, dabble, and babble. Coyote pads through boggy slop, skirting the minnow seekers. So you can see some people near the side of this lake or this marshy area looking around for minnows and frogs and things like that. And then you can see uh, the coyote is looking for maybe this frog or something tasty. Somebody is asking, is there a mod in the chat or someone to answer questions? If people have questions, sorry, I should have mentioned this at the top. Um, if you're in the chat, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and put them in the chat and I will uh, get to them as, as we get to them. Probably once I finish reading, um, if you have questions about Max, uh, the bald eagle or anything else that we have going on here. Absolutely, love to get questions. Thank you for asking. See our coyote looking for something on the edge of the pond. Near the shore, coyote's mate gives birth in their secret den. Growl, growl. Six squirming pumps, pups, six squirming pups, whimper and mule for food. You can see the coyote and then somewhere underneath these rocks, there are six little coyote pups. Now, coyote hunts to feed his famished family. He's on the prowl for plump rabbits, meaty snakes, and slurpy turtle eggs. A playful gust teases him with tempting scents. Coyote dreams of summer feasts. Coyote. I love the kind of urban landscape. We've got uh, a stone bridge here that people have built. You see the rabbits looking out. They might actually have some youngsters of their own that they're out gathering food for as well. Down at the lake, thunder clouds threaten. The sky cracks open. Drenching rain beats a pounding rhythm on docks and boats. Children jump, twirl, and umbrella whirl. 
Coyote herds his playful pups to shelter, safe from people and the storm's fury. I think a lot of us, especially up here in the upper Midwest, know those summer storms that come rolling through, kind of appearing out of nowhere and just dropping tons of rain and thunder and lightning. Even our vocal wildlife needs to keep an eye out. So there's the coyote parents and one of their pups. <laughs> At the shore, meat sizzles while picnic picnickers play. Coyote skulks until everyone leaves. He drools, darts, and snatches. This is a, I think the noise of maybe some, uh, some brats ripping apart or something is zip as he grabs onto this nice string of maybe hot dogs or sausages right off the grill. Very sneaky, very bold coyote. Another definite uh, aspect of, um, <laughs> of our, like I said, our urban wildlife, finding some more maybe human foods to eat. Coyote grabs a greasy feast to share with his growing pups. A brisk breeze sets leaves fluttering. Coyote sniffs the first faint perfume of fall. Here are the youngsters <laughs> working on those sausages. There are some leaves just starting to fall. Down at the lake, leaves swirl and spin. Wind whirl, sorry, <laughs> tongue twister today. Wind whirls autumn's litter into rustling piles. Frost nips at noses, ears, and toes. Children toss, tumble, and stumble. Coyotes yip, yelp, and howl, ha beneath the milky moon. Here we have our, I think this is our, maybe some of our same friends from the marsh earlier out playing in the big pile of leaves that they've been raking up, looking at the, the coyotes, howling under the moon. Near the shore, water birds snooze in feathery flocks. Shaggy shadows stalk, bounce, and pounce. Splish, splash, flap, up, up, up. Birds fly from needle-sharp teeth. See one of these Canada geese flying and taking off, trying to escape from our pouncing coyote. Those impressive jaws and those teeth that are perfect for grabbing on to other animals. I'm actually gonna point out, I love the details in these drawings. These are really, this is incredible artwork. So detailed. You can see all the fluffy fur on the inside of his ears. Really incredible. But one old goose will feed the coyotes tonight. A freezing squall brings fleeting flurries. Coyotes shake droplets from his winter coat. So you can see <laughs> dad bringing back this very large Canada goose. Perfect meal for these six hungry pups look very eager to get in on that. Snow just starting to come down on those shaggy coats. Down the lake, new ice crackles and snaps. Here we have, this looks like you can just barely see some of the city over here on the other side of the lake. We have a squirrel up in the tree, coyote, looking up as the snow starts to fall down. And a pretty familiar scene to those of us in the upper Midwest, I think. There is a supplementary page here that has, uh, I don't know if this is supposed to be the Institute of Art, but it kind of looks like it. I don't think it, maybe it's not quite the right, I don't think it has the big statue. <laughs> Uh, but this is a nice kind of beautiful city building with a coyote walking in front. And here's some information. Get some vocalizations in from our bald eagle. I'm going to read this and then I know that there are some questions in the chat. So I'll read this while we look at our uh, resident, one of our other resident city scavengers. Coyotes are smart, curious, and adaptable. 
They live on prairies, in forests, and on farmland. They even live in cities such as Minneapolis, Chicago, and New York. City coyotes might make their homes in parks or in nature preserves or on golf courses, all places where they can find plenty of food and shelter. Sometimes they live in small family groups and sometimes they live alone. What does a city coyote eat? Well, just about anything. They gobble up rodents such as rats, mice, and squirrels. They dine on rabbits, snakes, lizards, fish, and birds. They even munch on apples that fall from trees and steal vegetables from people's gardens. If you put out food for your dog or cats, they might eat that too. Never leave food or garbage where coyotes can find it. Instead, let them help us by eating those pesky mice and rats. You might never see a city coyote because they are shy. They usually travel at night to keep away from people. But you might hear one because coyotes are noisy creatures. They bark, yip, yelp, and howl to say, I'm here, where are you? Or, hey, if I don't know you, stay away. Some people are afraid of coyotes, but coyotes rarely bite people. If a, coy <coughs> if a coyote approaches you, don't run away. Instead, stand tall, wave your arms, and shout to frighten it away. Coyotes are beautiful wild creatures. We can really enjoy sharing our cities with them. This is, let me see if there's anything. Here's a, a picture on the back page, that beautiful kind of city landscape. So this was, again, a wonderful, let me actually look and see. Yeah, this one doesn't say exactly where uh, the authors are from, but this was published by the Minnesota Historical Society. So this is Hungry Coyote by Cheryl Blackbird with illustrations by Lori Capel. Again, I just love that there were so many kind of just little background sneak previews of some of the Twin Cities areas in Minneapolis, which is, I think, really exciting. So let me, I noticed saw a couple of questions coming up. We can talk a little bit more about maybe how bald eagles and coyotes are a little bit related, but I know I saw a couple of great comments and everything in the chat. So let me open up one. I need to extend one out. Oh, perfect. Um, thank you. This is from uh, Jamie Rain. Uh, do you need volunteers or have any internships available or anything um, that would be kind of similar um, or other ways that maybe you can, you know, get involved and help out? Um, really, really excellent question, Jamie. Thank you for asking. Um, so here at the Raptor Center, uh, we rely a lot on volunteers. A lot of wildlife rehabilitation organizations really, really do. Um, so we generally have a crew of anywhere from 200 to 300 volunteers who are helping us out in just a huge variety of ways. Um, so depending on people's experiences and interests, um, we have lots of different kind of ways that we're looking for help. If you want to check out kind of all of the different things that we are looking for and folks that uh, we're kind of in need of, you can check out on the Raptor Center's website at theraptorcenter.org. Um, you can check us out there. There's actually a full tab just about volunteering and getting involved. Um, so you can reach out to uh, the email address there. There's some kind of descriptions of the different kind of the different kind of volunteer positions that we have. Um, in general, we have our education crew. So those are working with our resident education birds. So up here um, with our resident birds who are teaching people about the environment. We also have a crew of wonderful clinic volunteers who help our veterinarians and rehabilitators um, to be able to help do medical exams, um, help make sure that the birds are kind of getting ready to go back out into the wild. Um, we have a crew of volunteers who help us specifically with kind of um, bird physical therapy, our flight crew, um, who gets birds outside to do some practice flights and evaluate their flying style, making sure that they're getting plenty of exercise, that they're building up the kind of wing and kind of leg strength that they really need um, to be able to live out in the wild after maybe a longer time of healing from injuries. Same thing like if we were to break a bone, it might take us a little bit of work to kind of get back up to our full kind of capacity. Um, and then we also have an amazing network of transport volunteers who help us get birds from different places around kind of the upper Midwestern area, mainly here in Minnesota, but definitely also reaching a little bit into maybe the Dakotas, Wisconsin, Iowa, um, trying to get those birds here where we can help them out. So we have people who go out and actually retrieve birds. Um, you know, maybe somebody finds a bird in their local park or in their yard or something like that, and they're not able to kind of capture that bird, but they, they know it needs help. Um, they're just not quite able to do it themselves. Or it's a larger bird like a bald eagle where you maybe want a more experienced handler trying to restrain that bird and bring it in. Um, and then we also have people who are helping us um, do a lot of kind of road tripping, helping us to kind of connect these birds 
Sometimes we have birds who are four or five hours drive away. Um, we have some kind of different people who can help us kind of relay race the birds down to the raptor center so we can get them the help that they need. And then, and then once the birds are all healed up, they need to go back to where they were found to be released for the most part. So we have some great transportation volunteers as well. So uh, Jamie and anyone else who is curious, um, definitely check out. We have a whole tab on our website about getting involved and how you can uh, potentially volunteer or other ways that you can help us out. Which we really appreciate. Um, let me see, I know there was a couple others. Um, and you're listening while drawing. That's fantastic. I am just such a big fan of all of the um, kind of artwork and stuff. Um, yeah, somebody was asking too. Um, so this actually, thank you, uh, Kirsten, my audience plant, who has specifically asked about uh, us reopening, folks. We're opening back for tours um, because it's been such a long time since a lot of these birds have been really seeing people all, or a lot of people all at once on a regular basis. I mean, for quite a period of time, they were seeing maybe one person at a time and then we added in a few more. Now they're trying to see a few more people as we're kind of intentionally getting them used to new volunteers and things like that. Um, but they really haven't seen our kind of big tour groups coming through. So we are starting off kind of kind of taking it easy with um, pre-scheduled. So if you go onto our website, it's raptorcenter.org. Um, you can also find some links and then we posted here on our Facebook page. Um, you can find some information there for how you can sign up for those tours. You have to pre-register online. Um, they're limited to 10 people each for right now, um, kind of at designated time. So you can check out the times that are available, see what might work for you. Um, and then um, we're going to um, kind of hopefully be able to adjust from there. But we wanted to start off in a way that we knew that everyone would be really comfortable with um, the birds in particular. Wanted to make sure that they're all doing really well with groups of people coming through. Because just like I think a lot of us who are maybe still getting used to seeing lots of people or more people all at once, it can sometimes be a little bit overwhelming. Um, and for birds, got to make sure that they are really comfortable and safe and doing well as well. So um, certainly my plan uh, is we're going to keep on. I still have uh, lots of books and lots of great content. I know I have a couple um, as we get into July, um, there will be a couple of times where we will not be live. We'll have some pre-recorded videos for reading with raptors along with another episode of drawing with raptors. If you missed that the first time, uh, we have an amazing video with uh, a children's book author and illustrator, Henry Cole. I'm um, doing some more drawing with raptors this time a great horned owl who I think makes for a particularly good drawing subject. So definitely check that out. That'll be sometime in July. Um, we'll let you know the exact date as we get closer, uh, finishing doing some editing. So we'll um, definitely have some of some of those all planned. So that's still the plan because um, these are really fun. Thank you guys so much for joining us every week. Um, oh, and somebody in Uptown just in Uptown Minneapolis. So pretty hop in place in Uptown with all those, but a lot of parks and things like that. So people seen coyotes down in the middle of the city. Some people really excited for visiting soon, uh, which is really, really exciting. Um, oh, a really, really good question, Jamie. I might have to um, respond to this one in text. I might have to look up a couple. Um, somebody was asking for like any recommended reading to aid with education in this field while or before volunteering. Um, in general, for just like bird information, I know I tell people this a lot, but the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, both, um, <laughs> both their kind of main website of learning about birds in particular, but they actually also have a lot of great um, kind of supplementary educational activities about just kind of birds in general. If you're more interested in specifically like wildlife rehab, um, there are also a lot of really great resources, but it might be easier for me to just link those in the comments. So I might um, swoop in and reply to the comment here after we finish up our video um, and we can uh, <laughs> uh, send you some directions. Um, for people who are interested in wildlife rehab, uh, wildlife biology, things like that, um, some really great organizations to look into um, are uh, National Wildlife Rehabilitation Association, NWRA. Um, they have some really, really great resources um, right now and a really fantastic website. Um, I was just on there looking around. Um, so definitely NWRA is a great one to check out. They have some really, really great resources on there as well. But I'll link a couple in the, uh, in the replies on here. But thanks so much, Jamie, for being so interested and so exciting. You're so excited about everything. Awesome, I think those are all the questions. I will point out some, some of the noises. I don't have anything in my hands. So we had to get at least one really good full bald eagle vocalization in there. 
Um, so while you are watching, if you're watching any maybe Independence Day, 4th of July themed activities, documentaries, anything like that, when you're seeing bald eagles on the screen, if you hear them making other noises, perhaps maybe a very harsh screaming noise, um, now you know and you can tell other people, this is what bald eagles actually sound like. The noise that is often played, that harsh screaming noise, is actually the dubbed over voice of a red-tailed hawk. For some reason, people don't think that this is as exciting, maybe? I don't know. I think it's pretty impressive. Um, I have actually measured how loud this particular bald eagle can be, and she went over 120 decibels, which is about the same as standing next to an ambulance siren. So I don't know how loud this is coming through on your speakers, but in person, right next to her, it is pretty loud. You can see that that is a noise that could really carry really well over big open lakes, rivers, the ocean side. Um, that's normally where these birds are spending a lot of time where they need to communicate with other bald eagles and say, hey, this is my tree, this is my patch of water, everyone else go away. Um, you need to be able to do that very, very loudly so other birds can hear you from far away. So they have a pretty loud, loud vocalization and that really impressive kind of the head throwing back and everything, um, really fantastic. I'll also point out too, since you'll probably see mostly adult bald eagles in your 4th of July related media, um, you're gonna be seeing a lot of adult bald eagles with that white head, the white tail, the yellow beak and eyes, that really impressive look. Um, but that is an adult bald eagle. They don't actually look like that until they're about five to six years old or so. Um, this bald eagle actually, as she looks around, she even still has some like little streaks of darker feathers on her head, even though she's about 22 years old this year. Um, so she didn't ever fully grew it in if you look kind of up close, but she still has that really good classic bald eagle look. Um, but they start off all very dark brown. Even their beaks and their eyes are a very dark brown. It takes about five to six years of kind of losing those old feathers, growing in new ones, with maybe a little bit more white, maybe some kind of splotches of darker color in there. Those transitional or juvenile bald eagles have some of the most gorgeous feathers. Um, so definitely keep an eye out for those, especially as we get later into the summer when the juveniles start flying around a bit more as they're learning how to fly and hunt on their own. So you can check them out, but keep an eye out for those if you are watching any sort of bald eagle related media um, for the Independence Day weekend. You can check that out. With that, everyone, thank you so much. And thank you so much for all of your questions. Uh, Jamie, I will get back to you and send a couple of uh, uh, links your way. So everyone else, if you're interested in more information about wildlife rehab, uh, wildlife biology, environmental education, I'm going to put a few links in the comments of this video that you can check out. Um, <laughs> um, but thank you all again so much for joining us. We are so excited to hopefully see some of you back here uh, in the building looking at birds out in the spots where they're normally living, not just seeing the kind of program room that we've been spending most of our time in here for our Facebook Live videos. Um, we're really excited to see you all back, so definitely check out our website, theraptorcenter.org. You can also check us out on here on Facebook and uh, at The Raptor Center on Instagram. So we'll keep you posted on all of those. And thank you all so much. Keep an eye out for your urban raptors, your bald eagles, especially here during the, the appropriate season, the 4th of July season. And also keep an eye out for your other urban scavengers, your coyotes, and some other creatures that you might have living in your area. So good luck with the heat, everybody. Hope you stay cool and enjoy the uh, very safe and fun filled 4th of July weekend. We'll see you all next week for more Reading with Raptors. Bye, everyone.